Well, we are wrapping up today our Advent series. Jonathan and I have had a great time this Advent season, starting with some passages in Isaiah and then seeing how they might be in the Gospels and even uh, in other passages um, in, uh, in the Scripture. And here um, we are coming to an end uh, with our Come Thou Long Expected Jesus series, and we are talking about God with us. Isaiah chapter 7 and then Matthew chapter 1. Follow along, please. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Matthew chapter 1. But as Joseph considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means... God with us. He's making his list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out if you've been naughty or nice. Because why? Santa Claus is coming to town. Now, I don't know who gave Santa Claus the godly attributes of all-knowing. But as we have sung and enjoyed this little Christmas ditty, I have to admit it's a bit creepy I mean, it might even be worse than Elf on a Shelf. Jolly old St. Nicholas is coming to town to reward the good and punish the bad. I mean, it kind of sounds like what the Bible tells us about Jesus. But there's one very important, no, there's one extremely important difference about Santa Claus coming and Jesus coming. Santa Claus doesn't want to be with you. He just wants to make his delivery, gulp down the cookies and milk you offered him, and then bolt off to his next shipping location, much like we've seen all the FedEx and and, and USPS and all the folks that are scurrying around delivering all the Amazon packages. That's Santa Claus's agenda. And afterwards, he heads back to the North Pole, never to be seen or heard from until the next Christmas Eve. My friends, Jesus coming is quite different than that. He comes because he wants to build a relationship with you. He didn't just come to do his things and then dash off. He came to initiate a meaningful and forever relationship between you and him. Santa Claus He's with us for just a night, and then he crams himself down the chimney. We don't see him. We see the crumbs and the half glass of milk, and he's gone. Jesus, he is God with us forever. In our scripture reading, we read the word Emmanuel. You know, it's only found twice in the Old Testament, Isaiah 7, 14 and 8, 8, and it's only found once in the New Testament, which we read in Matthew 1, 23. Now, to understand the significance of this word, which itself means God with us, let's, let's note the context in which it first appear. Syria and Israel, the northern kingdom, had desired to form a coalition with Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, in order to oppose the increasing power of Assyria. Judah vacillated, and Syria and Israel determined to punish her. And upon hearing this news, King Ahaz trembled. And Isaiah the prophet was sent to him to inform him that he had nothing to fear. The power of his enemies had played out, and they could do him no harm. 
Isaiah even commanded Ahaz to ask for a sign in confirmation of this divine message. But Ahaz refused to do so. And so in response to this act of this hypocritical king, Isaiah announces that the Lord will give the people a sign. The prophet beholds a virgin who is with child and about to bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. Two key things I want to bring out in this passage. Number one, this the, the birth of this child is to be a sign. So there should be something unusual about this birth. After all, the birth of the child is an everyday occurrence. My wife, Tammy, served as a, a, a nurse in, in the labor and delivery. It, it happens every day, and in the full moon, it even happens more. Babies are born every day all over the world. But this is an unmarried woman that the sign will come from. But you know, if you think about it, unfortunately, child out of wedlock, out of wedlock is something that occurs fairly regularly. What will make this child's birth stand out so that people will recognize that this is a sign from God? How about an unwed woman of impeccable character who's never consummated her relationship with a man. In other words, a virgin birth, a supernatural event, a miracle. Now that would get some attention for sure. And then this child is named Emmanuel or will be called Emmanuel. And we need to note the force of this term. The name is meant for the child himself. In his birth... The presence, the very presence of God is to be found. God has come to his people in a little child. And that very child whom Isaiah also later names Mighty God. You see, Isaiah is seeking to dissuade men from trusting the Assyrian king. The nation's help rests not in Assyria, but in God. Don't form a treaty or a coalition to fight. God will be the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, your champion, who will fight for you. And in this dark moment, Isaiah is saying, God will be with his people, and he will be found in the birth of a child. But if you've read your Bible, you find out this child didn't come till much later in Israel's history. Not only had the Assyrians eventually conquered the northern and southern kingdoms, but then Babylon came and did the same, and then Rome came and conquered Israel. Israel has been waiting a long time from, for this miraculous sign, this, this child born of a virgin, that God would visit his presence once again to Israel. And then he came. The promised sign from God to rescue his people was born of a virgin Mary. Jesus Christ was God with us, fully man and fully God. But how can this be? Was he more man or more God? Or more God than man? Uh, was, his, was his body human, but his soul deity? Now hang with me a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a little theological on you before we go practical. When the Word became flesh, as John put it in chapter 1 of his gospel, Jesus' deity was not abandoned. It was not reduced or contracted. Nor did he cease to exercise the divine functions which had been his before. It is he, we are told, 
who sustains the creation in ordered existence and who gives and upholds all life. And you can find this in Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews 1. And all the functions were certainly not in his suspension during his time here on earth. He's fully God. He has access to all of that power, all of that knowledge. He can be everywhere. And when he came into this world, he emptied himself of outward glory. And in that sense, he became poor. But this does not at all imply a curtailing of his divine powers. The New, Tr- the New Testament stresses the Son's deity was not reduced through the incarnation. In the man Christ Jesus, says Paul, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The incarnation of the Son of God, then, was not a diminishing of his deity, but an acquiring of manhood or humanity. It was not that God the Son came to indwell a human being, like an alien invasion that comes and sort of sucks the brain out and inhabits uh, uh, the human host. That's not what God had done through Jesus. He didn't just simply clothe himself in a human body and taking the place of its soul. He took to himself a human soul as well as to a physical life. And Jesus' humanity was complete. He became the man, Christ Jesus, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 2. And his humanity is permanent. Though now it's exalted as he has ascended into heaven, the Westminster Confession puts this this way. Jesus continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. And my friends, that's how Emmanuel, God with us, can be with us. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, and he walked the very earth that we walk. And he cried when he was hungry and needed his diaper changed, and he had to do chores and obey his parents, and he had to get along with his siblings. And he underwent the very temptations and difficulties in life that we do. Jesus was with us in the person of Jesus Christ. That's how God was with us. And my friends, God loves to be with us. He's not like Santa Claus who kind of avoids us, really. He's got to break in our houses to deliver gifts. God did it completely differently. He busted a hole in heaven and he had angels singing and a a huge star to announce his birth. Yes, he came to a, a, in humble means to a humble couple, but yet cosmically, this completely reordered all of earth and history. And God loves to be with us. He adores what he created, and humanity is the pinnacle of his creative thought and, and power. And not only does he want to be with us, he longs to be with us. He wants wants to have conversation with us. He wants to to meet our needs. He wants us to come to him for advice. He wants for us to come to him when we're in trouble. It's much like if you're a parent, you love that about your children. And as they get older and older and they they get to the teenage years and all they do, they seem to lose some of their language skills and all they do is grunt and text and want to live in a cave of isolation. You long to hear from your kid. And then they grow up to be adults, go away to college and then get their jobs and move out of the house, move out of the state. And all the things that you love to do when they were little... You want to do still when they're older. You want to have meaningful conversation with them. You would love to meet their needs. Not all of them, but appropriately as as an adult to an adult to help them out. 
You love for them to come to you for wisdom and advice. And especially if they're in distress or trouble, didn't matter if they were two-year-old, 22, or 42. It still means something to us as a parent when our child, even as an adult, says, man, I need your help. That's exactly how God feels. Whether you're two or 22 or 42, he wants to have a meaningful conversation with you. Come to him with advice, ask for advice. What command do we find over and over again in the Bible? It's this, fear not. Have I not commanded you? Do not worry and do not be afraid. Might be the number one most repeated commandment in the Bible. Fear not, don't worry, don't be afraid. Why? Why should I not be afraid? Tell me. And the Lord does. He says, for the Lord your God is with you. And we have ample evidence of this declaration throughout Scripture. God tells Moses in Deuteronomy, I am with you. Moses tells Joshua, because God gave Moses this message to tell Joshua as they're the mantle of leadership is, is changing, and he says, Moses, God tells Moses to tell Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. David tells his son Solomon, son, the Lord is with you. Hezekiah tells the people of God, Friends, God is with us. Psalm 46, twice, the psalmist says, The Lord of hosts is with us. Isaiah 8.10, God with us. Zechariah 8.23, God is with you, the prophet says. Isaiah to the people, Isaiah to us. Emmanuel will be born. He has been born. God with us. The angel tells Joseph, your son will be known as Emmanuel. God with us. And when Emmanuel or Jesus Christ was here on this earth, he practiced what his name meant. In Mark 3.14, we find Mark's description of the choosing of the 12 disciples. And he appointed 12 to be with him. I had a mentor uh, in ministry when I was growing up. His name was E. Stanley Ott III. We just called him Stan. But Stan used to say this. He thinks that the word with might be the absolute most important word in the Bible. It might, you know, some of you might argue, want to argue with me. Oh, it's justification. No, it's... It's glorification, oh, it's sanctification, it's repentance, it's confession, substitutionary atonement. Stan would just say, no, it's with. Because without, if God is not with us, all that other stuff doesn't happen. And all that other stuff happened because God was motivated and desired to go at great lengths to be with us. And Jesus loved being with his friends as he's here on earth. He loved being with people. Jesus was a people person. And he shared his healing power. He shared his wisdom. He shared his life. He shared his life to the point of giving it up voluntarily so that you could be freed from the guilt and shame of your sins. He wanted to be with us so much. He had to abandon the presence and the power and the prestige he had in heaven. He had to abandon the presence with God his Father to pay the penalty of our sins on the cross so that we could be rejoined in a good, steady, permanent relationship with our Father. Because Jesus paid the penalty for all of that. 
And my friends, Jesus wants to be with you. Listen to what he says in Revelation 3.20. He says this. This is Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. And he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. My friends, God wants to be with you. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be with you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's God's motivation. He delivered Jesus so that Jesus could deliver us from the shame and guilt of sin. Santa Claus just comes and delivers good gifts to the nice and a lump of coal to the naughty. Jesus comes because he wants to dispel and dispense grace and mercy and love and kindness and peace and forgiveness to you. Will you believe that? Will you believe that God wants to be with you? I'm sure you've said, but man, if he only knew what I have done, he already knows. If he only heard what I've said about other people, he already knows. He's heard it. He's known it, and he's heard it, and he's seen it. And he still says to you, come on over. Let's have a meal together. Sit at my table. Let's be friends. I want to be with you forever. I like you. Christmas can be lonely. This COVID separation has made us all a bit lonely. But Jesus is with us, friends. If you invite him to come be with you, he will not turn down that invitation, but he'll come running. So let's look to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And let's be with him, the God who longs to be with us. Let's pray. Lord, we need you to be with us. It's been a long hard, and oftentimes lonely road that we've been on this this year of 2020. So would you come again in your own way to meet our needs, to dispel our loneliness, to look at us and to smile, to give us a strong and sure footing in this shaky world to make us more confident and more poised as we are able to love and share more. We can't do this all alone. We can't do it by ourselves. But we need you to be with us. So come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.